Ladies and gentlemen, 60 years offer perspective, perspective to reconsider what do we know about it. Do we know really what is to be known about that event 60 years ago? I am called here, I am pleased to serve in this forthcoming minutes as, the, as an eyewitness. I have been doing this since 60 years, going around the globe in various capacities after 1956 as a representative or as a leader Hungarian Revolution, around the globe, so eyewitness participant. Then I dealt with the subject as a scholar, the, the political science, the, the his, then, then history, then the economics. So I am not attempting to share with you any of my writings those have virtues, and curious people occasionally read them. I take literally the word of invitation as an eyewitness. I recall to you, ladies and gentlemen, some of the events and to some degree the interpretation of it. I trust that during the time of questions and answers, and probably later in the day, uh, some of the things might be brought up by some of you, which appear to be particular interest, calling for clarifications. Clarifications could be the first thing I comment on. Good to know the truth, the reality. Good to know how things are, how things have been, where Hungary, where from has Hungary arrived to the revolution and the aftermath. The aftermath, we leave it sometimes. It is an asset gives us inspiration, strength. Sometimes it's almost a liability, not because of the revolution itself, or the way it is understood, interpreted in our society, in Hungary, and around the world. Time and again, my going around the world in capacity of a professor of economics, but with the background of a Hungarian revolution person. The question was posed, who was the leader of the Hungarian revolution? Are you the one? Imre Danaj. And, and no, there's a great many names listed. And I have to come during the second days when these questions were posed to me, that no one person or no one group of people are to be named, identified the leader of the Hungarian Revolution. I might even philosophize a little bit, telling that revolutions really do not have leaders. Revolutions are done by the revolting people, the rising people. The people of Hungary rose, and it amounted to a revolution. In this context, there are volunteers, people who claim to be in the know, or people who honestly have been digging into the matters, and they have an explanation of the revolution and they 
evaluate the process. That revolution, which, as I had already mentioned, was an uprising of people. All the various things we heard from Kodolányi Gyula so eloquently, the Communist Party, the, uh, the pains, and tribulations of Hungary. It's good to know, good to remind ourselves that the revolution, to a significant degree, was really the result of those things we heard as the background. The disappointed, disillusioned people who felt cheated, as it was, as the communist tyranny kept telling how wonderful it is when everybody saw it the opposite. There were some authors, writers, probably I used to say that the revolution's strongest inciters was the, the communist lies. For a while, people kind of hear lies, make, listen to it, and then, then ignore it. But there comes a cumulative process, a kind of synergistic cumulative process, when people become indignated. What do they think that how fool we are? The, the cheating, expecting that we, the Hungarian people, are so ignorant that we are going to swallow and listen to that and even believe it. And then comes the interpretation to further on that those gatherings, Petrifi Circle, and the writers' associations meetings, and some of the uh, workers' councils which began to take shape. Yes, they have posed the questions and they have made comments that this society, that society was in the process of destabilization. This, may I use the scholarly definition of the process. Then came the interpretation during the days of the revolution, and especially later, that who contributed to it to what measure? Within the country, I have already mentioned some of the agents. Then we heard time and again, and it's a recurrent, lasting theme, to what degree the revolution was encouraged from outside, encouraged, more than encouraged, incited. What was there? promises, pledges from outside the world to do the rising. Right at the beginning, uh, I mentioned the recurrent talk, writings about the role, what it was, was there any, of the Free Europe Radio. Some of you know Probably most of you we know there was from the United States of America sponsored organization broadcasting radio broadcast news events literature good journalism in, in its way telling about reporting to Hungary on what is happening in Hungary well journalists of the West, especially Hungarian researchers, kept an eye on it and were reasonably good, accurate reports through the Free Europe Radio what is happening, what was happening in Hungary. Sabo Zoltan from London, 
London, was he. Uh, Kovács Imre, some of them 250 words. Quite accurate, who is interested, please dig into it. To the question, to the point that was the revolution encouraged from America, there is especially one good quotation, I probably call for a quotation, which would strongly and solidly dispel, dispel the notion that the revolution was initiated, encouraged, incited from outside the country. Specifically the Free Europe Radio, which was an American United States sponsored, maintained institution. As I have already mentioned, it was professional journalists reporting on Hungary events and in the world as they thought might be interested to the Hungarian audience. To the notion that it was, it had a role in the Hungarian revolution and encouraged the Hungarian people to uh, revolt, I suggest who is interested look into it and I am going to call here for a quotation which will show you, show us that the one sentence or a few sentences that could come closest to something that the Americans or somebody in the West might have thought that there will be a Western, especially American, intervention. Yes. Oh, we have the recording. Shall, shall we hear it, please? Ha a szovjet hadsereg valóban megtámadja Magyarországot, ha ez a félelmünk valóra válik, és a magyarok három-négy napig kitartanak, akkor a nyomás ellenállhatatlanná válik az Egyesült Államokban a kormányra, hogy Washington nyújtson a szabadságharcosoknak katonai segítséget. Ezeket írja mai számában az Observer. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish we see the context, what is this quotation? This is a, 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 a newspaper, that, what was the newspaper? A British newspaper, is it? The Observer. It's a respective newspaper which has not quoted or referred to the existence or non-existence of Western military assistance or promise of it. Specifically, as we've heard in the words, in their words, a journalist came to the, as journalists do, to guessing the facts what they see and whatever they th think about it. The journalist writes that if the Hungarian revolution after the crushing of it by the second Soviet military intervention, if the Hungarians, the freedom fight, lasts, endures for three, four days, that some assistance is, is obligatory. So it was no promise, no pledge for any official person, especially those who make foreign policy, who made foreign policy or, or global statistics. So this very lean thread, if it were known, those who, who claimed Western military promise, or even more, as sometimes we heard, blaming the United States, that Americans promised to us and they left us alone. This is a recurrent theme. I'm sure that many of you heard it. And sometimes, most of the time, it almost taken by face value. It's a recurrent theme. If not shaping, but at least shadowing, influencing. 
the relationship of Hungary to the world does not benefit from attributing misconceived ideas to partners, in this case, to the Freiro Radio and those who were behind it. It is worth elaborating, and probably we could in the question and answer period or later in the day. I have known the participants who did it, who were uh, instrumental in it. I would rather uh, come to the really to the eyewitness aspect of it. Yes, I was in the revolution. I was someone out of former communist prison, a factory worker. I jo joined the march to the parliament square where Imre Nagy, after lengthy attempts of the communists to pacify things, came out and said, Kedves elvtársak, and sounded the hundreds of thousand people, nincs elvtárs. I stood long, close enough to the balcony where Imran I stood. I sensed it, that he kind of got shocked. What is it? And then took a deep breath and said, Magyar testvéreim. And such jubilant choir, or, 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 or uh, shall I say, the, the, the square, the parliament square, as if it began to move on that. Greeting Nagyimre, telling that Kedves Magyar Testvérek, and Montam, it wondered, and then he related what he related and came the events. That evening, the crowd, the two, three hundred thousand, might have gone home as we did, if not for the, the military intervention during the following night. Then, in the revolution itself, it was the people. No, any one particular leader here from there no any one particular party. Uh, one example, I must say, I was walking on Főutca, and because that was the revolution, that people were walking on the streets when the government, the communist order was to stay home. So no people gathering might materialize. But that was the hundreds of thousands of people moving, walking. At the street corner, I met three persons with whom I was in the prison. They happened to be the Arrow Cross, the right wing people, and that was the reason they were in prison. But you know, prison people are melt, so I, some, we came to know each other. And then, street, meeting on the street corner during the hours of the revolution, I asked them, Where are you doing? What, what are you doing? Says, we are not in any of these things. This is not our affair. This is some communist something. So I am recalling this event that the right wing Hungary did not regard the Hungarian revolution as their own event. It was that Hungarian people who recalled 1945 when it had the opportunity, the chance, even the mandate from the allied, from the great powers, to have human rights society, free elections, the Hungarian people lived with it, and remarkable successful free election. The world jubilated it, praised for us. Came then, then the reconstruction, land reform, which has been for decades the dream of Hungary. Unfortunately, the earlier years, it has not materialized, and somehow the event coincided with it could be done when the Soviet army, why it was. It does not reduct, reduce anything from the significance and the desire from it. Further on, 
when the Hungarian people feel, felt that that democratic really elected par parliament and government, the government of Nagy Ferenc and Varga Béla and Kovács Béla and others accomplished things, then those accomplishments have been destroyed when the Soviet army in 1947 betrayed the agreement in which the Soviet, the, the three power promised Hungary democracy and guarantee and in, in fact mandated, compelled that we do it. We did it and then the Soviet Union when they changed their mind, imposed communist government. Here I used to interject because there was no, never communist takeover in Hungary. It was not communist takeover. They had 17% parliamentary role. It was a foreign army, the world's strongest army, the Soviet Union here, which arrested, <coughs> arrested the Hungarian political elected leaders, including myself, and then installed communist leaders. And then they governed and they <clears throat> did what they did. That is the road leading toward the revolution. That's how revolution came about. The details somehow come together. I use the word of modern science in synergistic manner. Things reinforced each other. That experience then ought to be interpreted, worth interpreting. Huge, powerful forces there are in. The Hungarian Revolution was not, if we think of this, as something of a flame which somehow has, has, has come up on the somewhere. The Hungarian Revolution was rather the forthcoming of forces like charcoal, like ashes, like embers under, and that in the context of something, it gave la light to the reality, that light. That, that was how the revolution then became a revolution. Probably one word, time is the scarcest resource for me. One word is that the revolution could be thought of because it was as a star, as a comet on the skies of Hungary, a comet on the skies of the world of those days. And the flame, what happened the world's strongest military force destroyed it. Came then all the consequences. Here at home, a tyranny. We are who she took the role of representing it in the world at the United Nations, going around in the world. Eventually, that communist tyranny, which had been bound to make its own errors, have been doing and fell behind not only the promises, but of the reality, and this could be probably my last word, because there was on the Western side a commitment. The commitment was that of free nations. In the United States there was formed an association, the captive European nations. Every year a month was declared, a month of April vote the United States. Every president year after year through decades declared, this is the month of the captive European nations and we remember and we are committed to the freedom 
of the captive European nations. How has it come about? It has come about when, we, when the Soviet army here in Hungary in 1947 imposed communists. Then Truman Elnök insisted on democracy in Hungary. And when the Soviet Union rejected, President Truman initiated the, Atlant the, initiated the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization started here in Budapest in 